Hello, everybody, and welcome into the next edition of the Penn State Alumni Association's Virtual Speaker Series. I see the Zoom room filling up here. Go ahead and let us know who you are in your Penn State class year and where you're Zooming in from and where you'd like to take your next trip to. Today's theme is our alumni travel program. We'll be talking about everything that goes into our Alumni Association's travel program. So tell us where you want to go or uh, put in the chat box uh, somewhere that you've been uh, before COVID-19 and that you would recommend others to go. Again, welcome everybody in. I see the room filling up now over 56 participants here on the Zoom session with us. We'll be getting started in just a couple minutes, but go ahead and drop in the chat who you are and where you're from in your Penn State class year and where you want to go in terms of uh, your next Alumni Association trip that you want to take. See Verena from the class of 78, Roger Moyer from the class of 1970. Roger is a, is a regular here on the virtual speaker series. Always good to see his name pop up here. Again, Verena wants to go to Europe. She lives in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Sarah Murphy wants to go to the BVIs. I guess that's the British Virgin Islands. Thanks for tuning in, Sarah, class of 2008. Also one of our colleagues at the Penn State Alumni Association. I see Susan, Suzanne Parks wants to go to Italy, class of 1980. Mary was hoping to go to Glacier, Yellowstone, the Grand Tetons, Rocky, Mount, uh, Rocky Mountain in September, but may end up canceling due to COVID. Mary's a member of the class of 77. Jim DeLark checking in. How are you, Jim? Good to see your name up on the screen from the class of 66. I see Tom Murphy wanting to go to Spain and Carl Wooden. Carl is the vice president of our uh, Penn State Alumni Association, Great Valley Alumni Society, doing great work down there uh, with that campus. He's a 1991 graduate. Tom Smith from Western Michigan. Zooming in. Shannon from the class of 2016 wants to go to Italy. Carl wants to go to New Zealand. Again, let us know where you're zooming in from and drop that in the chat. Your, put your Penn State class here and maybe where you want to go on your next Penn State Alumni Association trip. I see Mark Hammond uh, was looking to go to Slovenia and Ireland, both canceled this year. Mary Lou Alfonso, class of 78, she wanted to go to Ober Amergau uh, in 2020, but that has been postponed. I just wanted to say that to show that I know how to pronounce Ober Amergau. Dave Lucas, class of 96, from the pizza capital of the world, right there in northeastern Pennsylvania, Old Forge, Pennsylvania, to be exact. He wants to go to Italy or Ireland again. Kathy Arntz, class of 74, wants to take the Rhine River cruise or go to the Canadian Rockies. I see Don Dries from the class of 68. I know Candy can't be too far from where he is. They want to go back to the Swiss Alps. We are going to be getting started here in just a minute, but I want to welcome everybody in to today's virtual speaker session. We got a great program lined up for you. Terry Kerr wants to go anywhere where there's clear blue water and white sand. Although I don't think she would scoff at the pink sands of Bermuda. Uh, Shango Kim, starting this fall uh, at Penn State, wants to go to New York in September. A lot of Italy's being represented here. I know we take a trip to Italy regularly on the alumni travel program, and maybe you'll hear a little bit more about those trips. Again, welcome everybody in and thanks for participating. I see you there, Pat, class of 66, wanting to go to New Zealand. And David from Tucson wanting to go to Slovenia. Teresa Smith also turning in, tuning in from Bullsburg. She wants to go to Italy as well. Judy Wolf, class of 70, wants to go to Iceland. Iceland has become a popular 
a popular destination as of late. It seems like a lot of people are taking trips there. And we are going to get started with our program today. So again, welcome everybody. Where else would you rather be than a Zoom full of Penn Staters? Thank you for joining us. I'm Paul Clifford, CEO of the Penn State Alumni Association. And I'd like to welcome everybody to today's virtual speaker session. As a reminder, today's session is being recorded and you can view our full list of virtual events at alumni.psu.edu slash events. Today, we welcome insiders of the travel industry featuring our travel partners from AHI Travel, Go Next, and Orbridge. As the COVID-19 pandemic continues, the impact on the travel in industry remains uncertain. Our panel of insiders today will discuss the current challenges being faced by the various sectors of tourism, including domestic and international travel and cruise lines, and what the future could hold for these industries. Later, we'll also be joined by my colleague, Kelly Morganti, the Assistant Director for Alumni Travel, for our Alumni Travel Program. I'm looking forward to bringing Kelly on to hear how she pulls all this together to offer a great variety of trips for Penn Staters. But first, I'm thrilled to welcome Mark Miller and Joe Small from AHI. Mark is the Senior Vice President of Sales and Joe is the CEO. Mark is celebrating his 23rd year with the company and he has helped to develop many of the very popular alumni campus abroad programs and has traveled extensively. Meanwhile, Joe's travel career spans more than 40 years and he has served as the Chief Executive Officer for AHI Travel for the last 24 years, I'm sorry, for the last 20 years. Mark and Joe, thanks for joining us and we're looking forward to hearing from you uh, and hearing more about AHI Travel. Thank you. And good day to everyone. It's my pleasure to be with you here today and to have a chance to talk about something all of us love, which is travel. I know we all share the hope that one day soon, we will be able to connect once again to the people, places, and cultures of the world. Thank you, Paul, Kelly, and Kari for organizing this great event. It's an honor to work with the Penn State Alumni Association and an honor to be here today. HI Travel has a long and storied history with Penn State that dates back more than 50 years and a tradition in travel that dates back nearly 60 years. It's our good fortune today, or your good fortune actually, that I'm going to share the Reader's Digest version about who we are. Um, we're a tour operator specializing in education and cultural travel for university alumni. We are the first company to specialize in this segment of the market and develop it on a national basis. Let's see, oh, I didn't take the slides. Let me see. Hello? There we go. Let's see here. I don't see the thing to take control. Joe, I think you have control. I do, okay, let's see. Yeah, so if you just go and hit your arrow button or hit next there. Yeah, I'll take it to your next slide. I apologize. It's it doesn't seem to be working. Let's see. There we go. Thank you. Um, so AHI were founded at the dawn of the uh, Jet H in 1962 by our father and stepmother, pictured here on the right, and we are now in our 59th year of operation. They were travel industry innovators who developed the alumni travel market partnering with university alumni associations and other nonprofit organizations throughout the US and Canada to provide their members with exclusive and in many cases pioneering international travel programs. They passed on their love of travel to us, that says on the left there. Interestingly, and perhaps very sadly, I think we are now older than they were when, this, when their picture was taken. 
Ours remains a family owned and managed business. I work alongside brothers Brian and Rick. Brian heads up our product and operations team. Rick has ultimate responsibility for our customer service and air teams. And he also serves as our legal counsel. I primarily focus my efforts on sales and marketing. Along with our experienced and talented team, we manage the strategic, tactical, and day-to-day -day operations of the business. Together, the three of us have logged in more than 100 years of experience at AHI Travel. This is the passion and project of our lifetimes. Our statement of purpose, which is shown here, identifies our unique selling proposition. This is what makes us different and explains what we do best. This statement resonates with our tradition of serving this market and focuses our thinking on how to best deliver on this promise. As an organization, we devote our resources, energy, talent, brains, organizational structures, systems, and procedures toward fulfilling this statement. I'll give you a few moments to just digest this. These are the characteristics and values that mark our long tradition of serving the market. We try to imbue every member of our team, both in Chicago and around the world with these values. From these, we develop this credo, which is our promise to our travelers. I'll also give you a few seconds to read this. Ours is a history of product innovation as well. All of our programs are dis exclusively designed for the alumni market, and not available through travel agencies or other retail outlets. Our tradition includes a number of industry firsts. As you can see, we have led the way in developing uh, European waterways. We've also created the very popular Alumni Campus Abroad concept, which features single stay, week long, in-depth explorations of a region based in quaint, off the beaten path towns or villages. The group size for these is limited to just 24 passengers. I also wanted to point out our commitment to personalized travel. We offer personalized your journey options in many of our programs. These are cultural or active or special interest opportunities that you can participate in depending on your interest. From our HI Flex Air options where you can choose your own carrier, your, your routing, your price, to uh, on-site choice and flexibility. Uh, we allow people to personalize their journey within the group dynamic. Our travel directors, all our trips are escorted by expert travel directors. They're there to ensure that your trip is worry-free. All of our on-site leaders are experienced travel veterans, multilingual and with a deep knowledge of the local culture. These are exceptional people. They handle all the logistics so travelers can pick, simply pack their curious minds and their comfortable shoes and enjoy the travel experience. Our guides and local experts have been specially selected to ensure you have an enjoyable and enlightening in-country experience. They bring the stories of the regions to life. They help you to better understand the culture and dynamics of the destination. They also fully understand the expectations of educated travelers. Before ending, I wanted to make you aware of our efforts to develop strong health and safety protocols for the time when the environment is once again right for travel. We have the systems and procedures in place and have trained our team so that when the sun rises once again on international travel, we have everything in place in order to welcome you onto one of our journeys. Thanks once again for allowing us to participate today, and thanks to all of you for listening. And that wraps up my side of things. Thank you, Joe. We'll come back to you in just a couple of minutes with some Q&A. But I want to now turn our attention to uh, and welcome in Zach Sales. Zach is the Director of Business Development for Go Next. 
He has more than eight years of experience traveling the world as the director of business development for Go Next, where he has worked in both domestic and international land programs and upper premium ocean, lake, and river cruise products. And so, Zach, welcome, welcome in to the virtual speaker session. Good morning, guys. Good afternoon to everybody. And uh, I'll echo Joe, and thank you so much for Penn State for putting this on. And uh, it's great to be on screen with everybody. So uh, to give you a little insight on Go Next, uh, we are a family-owned and operated company. Uh, we have over 48 years of experience coming up on our 50th anniversary here in 2022. Uh, again, based out of Minneapolis, and for many years, we've been partnering with alumni associations across the nation. Uh, we have a specific focus on upper premium uh, cruising. To talk and discuss a little bit about the GoNex experience, every trip that we put together is going to be value packed and it's going to be experience rich. I always like to say that we provide the structure as a company where it's needed and the flexibility where it's desired uh, from our travelers. Uh, when we're picking out destinations each and every year, we're hand selecting our vendors to make sure that the right products fit. Uh, we're selecting the destinations that we believe as a company are going to be uh, popular destinations with wonderful highlights and great opportunities for cultural immersion as well as educational opportunities. As a company, we put together pre and post uh, cruises. So uh, when you're, you know, for example, if you're going into Rome uh, to begin with, we're going to have a great pre in Rome. Uh, if you're ending in Barcelona, we're going to have a great post in Rome or post in Barcelona. Uh, we also put together our GoNex exclusive excursions, which are unique excursions in uh, great cities around the world where we see as a company that we can really provide a uh, wonderful value. Oh, I think my screen is frozen. There we go. Um, our, oh, we're jumping forward. Hang on just a second. Let me go back here. Hang on just a second. There's a little bit of a lag on my side. Hey, Carrie, do you mind taking my presentation back to the first slide? There we go. Zach, Zach, we're seeing your first slide right now. Okay, perfect. Um, I'll just I'll just tell you when to advance in that way because it's it's lagging pretty bad on my side, so um, not a problem at all. So if you want to advance to the next slide, Joe, if that's possible, and then the next one, and then you can go one more. Oh, one back. There we go. So our objective as a company is always to create uh, unique group focused experiences utilizing small to medium sized cruise ships. Uh, we want to have a consistent level of quality. Uh, we want to have great value for our travelers. Um, and that's why we partner with unique cruise lines uh, around the world. Uh, our partnerships are unique in the uh, in the fact that they are at the executive level. Uh, so when we go in and we contract with the cruise line, uh, we're securing price integrity. So what that means for you as travelers, uh, when you're traveling through Penn State, you're getting the best price available within the marketplace uh, for that specific supplier. So for instance, with Oceana, if you're taking an Oceana cruise, you're not going to find a better price point uh, out there or better value in the marketplace uh, than what you're receiving from Penn State. We also provide an extra layer of service at no additional cost for you. So uh, we have a great, um, we have a great uh, office staff inside the office, a great call center to help you arrange any shore excursions or uh, dining reservations, or really to answer any questions that you have. This might be your first cruise, your second cruise, or you might be a, a very well seasoned uh, cruiser. But if you ever have any questions, you can always call in uh, and we have a dedicated staff uh, to answer those questions. We also have program managers on board uh, that are seasoned. They've been with our company uh, for many year years. Uh, they practically live on board these ships, uh, but they act as an onboard concierge to help support you uh, throughout every step of your journey to make sure and ensure that you're having uh, the trip of a lifetime 
uh, that you, you want to experience. Go ahead, and Joe, you can uh, advance that next slide. So to talk a little bit more about these unique partnerships and relationships that we have with our suppliers, uh, we establish these relationships uh, to deliver an experience that you would not receive if you were just booking direct. Uh, these partnerships operate, uh, again, at the executive level. Uh, we have communication with uh, these companies uh, on a weekly basis, especially now uh, during this time. Uh, we improve on how we work on board the ship, creating a better experience for our guests and travelers. Uh, but we also advocate for our guests as well. And uh, that's what's really unique during this time period is the questions that we've gotten, the cancellations that we've uh, processed. Uh, we've been there every step of the way, uh, making sure that uh, we are guests first as a company, uh, making sure everybody uh, is happy and uh, ready to travel here in the new, near future. Uh, but along with these partnerships, um, the Go Next Group experience, we're focused on that. Uh, we're uh, trying to be consistent with every trip that we offer as a company. Uh, and these partnerships help us establish a wide breadth of products from both international and domestic that reach all seven continents. You can go ahead and advance, Joe, please. Take a look at uh, the portfolio of partnerships that we have. This provides us a variety of refined four and a half star superior products uh, that offer a specific level of service and exceeds expectations. So uh, we have Oceana Cruise Lines, we have uh, two of their O-class ships. These are the largest ships that we use as a company. So 1,250 passengers is the largest uh, ship that we're going to utilize. Uh, we have four R-class ships, uh, which have 684 passengers. Uh, American Steamboat Company, uh, their largest ship is the American Queen, uh, which has 424 passengers. Uh, so you have these smaller ships that give you as travelers a very unique experience, a very high level of service. Uh, these are not the 4,000 passenger ships. Um, you know, the, these ships allow you to uh, see your group, see the uh, alum that you want to uh, be with. Uh, we have great receptions and uh, cocktail uh, parties, as well as tailgates on board and lectures on board uh, that really lend for a very unique experience uh, throughout your journey. Uh, you can uh, go ahead and advance that slide, Joe. To take a look at uh, 2021 programs as we're all out there um, really itching to get back out there and experience the world. I wanted to share with you just a couple of uh, itineraries that we have through Penn State uh, for 2021 coming up here. In the first quarter, we have Myth Mayans and Marinas. Uh, this is a Miami to Miami itinerary uh, taking off in February. We have Middle East Meandering, which is a great uh, round trip Dubai uh, trip on Serena, which is a 684 passenger uh, ship with Oceana. Uh, Brazilian Spotlight, uh, it's going to be a great year to travel to South America in March. Um, Mediterranean Fusion, uh, we operate uh, usually two Mediterranean programs with the Penn State alumni uh, every year, uh, Istanbul to Barcelona. Uh, we're really excited for our Southern Culture and Civil War Spotlight as well. And this will be on the new American Countess, uh, which is a brand new ship with American Steamboat Company in, in June. Dalmatian Dynasties is another Mediterranean program, and that is Athens to Venice in September. And Romblas to Rivieras, which is October 25th to November 2nd, Barcelona to Rome. Uh, this is somewhat of a shoulder season uh, out there in the Mediterranean. Great opportunity to take advantage of a wonderful offer. So uh, with that, I uh, want to end my presentation and just thank, and thank all of you, and I look forward to speaking with you soon. Great, thank you, Zach. Now we're gonna hear from Penn State graduate, Vanessa Cheatham. Vanessa has served as the Senior Director of Sales for Orbridge for the past eight years. Prior to her work at Orbridge, Vanessa led the Alumni Relations and Advancement Office in the College of Fine Arts at Carnegie Mellon University. Vanessa is a proud 2000 Penn State grad, and she loves returning to campus with her two daughters, who she is convincing to become Nittany Lions as well. Welcome, Vanessa. Thank you so much, Paul. Uh, thanks also to Kelly and to Carrie for putting this together. I uh, sure wish that I could be on campus visiting with all of you, my fellow alums, but this is definitely second best, I'll take it. Um, so a little about Orbridge. Uh, our company was founded 13 years ago and we're headquartered outside of Seattle, Washington on Bainbridge Island. 
Uh, I've been with Warbridge for about eight and a half years, uh, enjoying my role as a senior director of sales for our team. We work with approximately 140 alumni associations, zoos, and museums. We work exclusively in the educational travel market, so uh, no independent travelers on our programs. It's solely um, Penn State groups and other alumni association groups as well. Uh, and we've been working with Penn State for approximately 10 years now. So uh, one of the most important guiding principles for Orbridge is that our programs are beloved by guests. That simply means for us that we focus on destinations that can offer a life-changing experience that guests will never forget. We do that by utilizing customized accommodations. Um, for example, small ship charters, small ship being 40 or 60 passengers. Uh, we use private family-owned villas on programs that are limited to 16 or 18 people, very exclusive to Penn State and other alumni associations. Um, specially craft excursions that are exclusive to your group that you wouldn't normally be able to, you know, access. Uh, and we, we try to offer a deluxe experience at a very value price. Some of the services that we provide include a dedicated guest service team that specializes in your program. That simply means that they've seen what you're going to see on your tour. We make it a point to send all of our team to evaluate and experience our programs so that they understand what our guests should expect uh, and make sure that we're always meeting those expectations. Um, they can speak specifically to your experience whenever you call them. We offer a curated expedition library that will include maps, field guides, uh, perhaps a coffee table book or a relevant novel that's received about six weeks ahead of time. We find that guests loves, love this as a way to uh, enhance their program. On, the, on, on our flavors programming, we offer a wine subscription from the vineyards uh, of the villas that we visit. Uh, we have dedicated travel directors that are on staff at Orbridge, and for us, that allows us to set expectations very high for our tour directors and expedition leaders, and they are oftentimes are um, leading many programs for us throughout the year, so they become acquainted with our guest expectations and ours as well. Uh, and we also are implementing safety protocol on our programming. It's obviously specific to each destination, but we can get into more of that. And, uh, and we're, we're finding that's um, been met with great uh, appreciation by guests and partners. We're offering a few programs with Penn State in 2021, um, two of which are based in North America. Orbridge offers about 40% of our programming, a little over 40% of our programming in North America, in particular focused on the national parks of the United States and Canada. Uh, we have a short duration civil rights program, Canadian programming, both in very uh, remote reaches of the wilderness, as with uh, a Northern Lights program we have, as well as travel by train uh, across Canada. Uh, so just quickly, Penn State's offering the Antarctic Discovery. That's aboard the World Explorer, a deluxe vessel of about 190 passengers. Um, we're offering the Canadian Rockies by rail during obviously the most beautiful time to possibly visit the Rockies. You travel by gold leaf service aboard the um, highly acclaimed Rocky Mountaineer. You travel during the day on the train in that dome viewing car that you can see to the left and then you overnight at the Fairmont properties and the Rim Rock Resort uh, within the Rockies. That's one of the properties um, with some pretty astounding views. Sorry, there we go. Uh, and Yosemite and Death Valley and the great parks of California. Uh, so we explore four of the major national parks in Nevada and California, including Death Valley, Yosemite, Sequoia, and Kings Canyon, um, Badwater Basin, and Ash Meadows National Wildlife Refuge are also part of that itinerary. Uh, we've offered this program in the past, but we took a break and revamped it. We're really excited about bringing this back and offering it with Penn State 
and we actually just last week received some new reservations for it. So uh, again, we're so excited and hopeful about the future of travel and those reservations were really, um, they were really exciting to see. Just quickly, a few other places that we go in case it piques your interest. As you can see, we offer quite a bit in the United States. Uh, we offer quite a bit as well in Canada. Um, much of it is wildlife centric. Uh, these are our, many of our flavors programs. And again, these are very intimate, immersive programs. Again, you see a family owned villas. Um, these are limited to about 16 to 22 people in any case. Uh, and then a bit in the Middle East and Asia. Thanks so much. All right, thank you, Vanessa. Uh, and we are going to stop sharing the screen. And I'm going to now invite my colleague Kelly Morganti to join me. Kelly is our assistant director for alumni travel. Currently, the Alumni Association offers 30 to 35 trips a year. Uh, throughout the world. Uh, and our first trip was actually run with AHI uh, in 19, in August of 1968. And so I don't, I don't want to do the math wrong here, but is that 52 years now of travel through the Penn State Alumni Association? Yep, about 52 years this week. Excellent. Kelly, let, let's start uh, our question and answer session with a question for you. You're responsible for pulling together the 30 to 35 trips that we offer on an annual basis to our alumni. What goes, what goes into your process? How do you choose where we go? How do you choose the, the host and kind of the educational component to all of this? Kind of peel back the onion on, on what your creative process is here. Um, well, as you mentioned, we do 30 to 35 trips, both domestically and internationally each year. Um, our goal is to provide a variety of destinations, but also different types of travel. So we want to make sure that we have um, some land packages, ocean cruise, um, small ship ocean cruise, as well as river cruising. Uh, the length of trip is something that we take into consideration. We know that not everybody has two weeks to be out of uh, their home. So we try and take that into a lot of consideration and then we look for various price points. Um, by working with the travel vendors such as AHI, GoNext, and Orbridge, all the aspects of the trip are arranged for the traveler. Um, they don't have to worry about anything on that. Um, they also offer expert guides and that's where we get our educational component. If we happen to have an exclusive departure, exclusive to Penn State, we often try and send a host with us, whether it's a faculty host who has a level of expertise in that area um, of the world or uh, something particular to that trip. Um, and often we're able to arrange some receptions with some international um, alumni who can join us and give their perspective on it also. So that's always really important to us. Um, the other thing that um, is really nice is when you travel with us um, on one of these trips, you're automatically traveling with family. It's your Penn State family. Um, we sometimes send staff members because we like to, you know, we, we are very strong blue and white supporters. Paul and I are supporting our, our blue and white today. Um, so, you know, yeah, we, we enjoy being able to give you that opportunity to, to talk to us in detail because we are right here at University Park. And we love to be able to tell the stories of our students and faculty from here. Um, right now, with the unprecedented effects um, that COVID has had on this industry, um, many of you have submitted questions, so I don't want to take up a whole lot more time. I want to be able to make sure that we get to um, these questions as quickly as possible. I'm going to open this up to all of our panelists, um, Zach, uh, Mark, Joe, uh, Vanessa. So anybody who wants to jump in and, and answer any of these questions. Um, the first one is, what do you see as the most logical path of progress for the resumption of international travel for tourists? Well, the, I'll start out. Um, I mean, I, th I think the first thing is that people have to feel comfortable um, going and traveling. And uh, that's the, the number one thing. And there's a, a couple aspects to that. I think one is getting up. Uh, if there's a certain number of people that feel like, hey, if I can travel, if we're not at level four, if we're at a level two travel advisory and borders are open and we can go places, then I think there's a certain number of people that if the right protocols are in place, are going to want to travel. And then I think there's a larger group that it's going to take having some kind of a vaccine 
that they feel comfortable with uh, to really get them back out on the road. So I'd say it's two, two levels. The, the big good news, I think I've read recently that the airlines are talking to um, countries around the world trying to have an agreement where people can be tested for COVID and if they've passed a test within a certain number of hours, you know, days, that they can then uh, travel internationally and be accepted into the countries. Right now, most countries are not accepting uh, US travelers. I'm talking particularly about international travel now. And then, and so I think that is obviously a, a first barrier that needs to be crossed, but that's good news that they're doing that. And of course, the second part of the good news is that there is um, some reports that there are, will be a vaccine sooner rather than later. And I think those are the big things that are gonna really get people going. Um, other than that, there's, there's a group of avid people that just wanna travel and they, they you know, feel like if the right health and safety protocols are in place that they're, they'd be willing to do so as soon as uh, logistically or governmentally it's, it's possible to do so. Yeah, we've done actually some great uh, surveying of uh, frequent travelers and the percentages have quite, uh, quite surprised us on how many of the frequent travelers, up to almost 60% uh, that really would like to go and travel uh, once a vaccine is, is around. And uh, also uh, those travelers were uh, surprising to us about 60% say they would travel in the new normal. So that was very, very encouraging to the surveys we put out uh, just last month. Yeah, I wanna ask Zach and Vanessa to, to join the conversation. Talk about, um, so Mark and Joe were addressing it from the travelers being ready to, to go ahead and make that decision to travel. But talk about it from the perspective of, of your companies. What are you doing to kind of uh, increase the confidence of travelers to, to choose one of your trips? What are the things that you're thinking about today that you weren't thinking about in February? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And, um, you know, we're working hard on our procedures as a company here at Go Next, but we're also working hand in hand with our uh, partners uh, with, within the cruise lines as well. Um, our, the cruise lines that we partner with, that we're working with, they're working hand in hand with the CDC as well as the FDA uh, to develop and implement really industry leading standards that are going to exceed these requirements. Um, obviously, you know, working with cruise lines, uh, the, the cruise lines were kind of like the front end uh, of the COVID outbreak, and they were very much in the news. So it's changing that that picture and, and really kind of trying to paint a new picture of, you know, a, a protected area on a cruise ship, kind of creating a bubble or an environment uh, that is healthy and safe. Um, our cruise lines that we partner with, too, um, they've done a great job putting together a panel of global health experts, um, MCL and Royal uh, Caribbean. Uh, they operate as an umbrella. MCL operates as an umbrella over Oceana. Um, has put together a great panel of, of these health experts. <clears throat> the former Secretary of Health and Human Services, Mark Levitz, on this, um, on this board, as well as the former FDA Commissioner, uh, Scott Gottlieb, uh, is also on this. And they're there to help, you know, really, you know, push forward and consult and uh, develop these health and sanitation protocols that are going to provide, I think, that confidence level that we're looking for uh, to get uh, these travelers back up and, and, and really on these trips. Um, but any, any partner of ours, um, American Steamboat Company, uh, they've partnered with uh, Oscar uh, Health, which gives them an opportunity to um, really expand a network of health professionals. But all the cruise lines, I think, are going to have extensive pre-embarkation screenings. They're going to have staggered embarkation check-in processes that provide great social distancing, um, touchless temp temperature screenings, uh, I think are gonna be very common. Obviously, continuous sanitation and fogging of social areas as well as state rooms, um, enhanced onboard medical teams. Uh, these are all gonna become the norm, I think. Um, and this is ever evolving. So, you know, what we say this week, um, the standards I think are only going to improve from here. So that's where we kind of set. Vanessa, how about from the Orbridge perspective? Sure. Uh, you know, similar to what Mark said, we surveyed some, some frequent travelers, and we've heard that the travelers are anxious to get back on the road again, uh, you know, and are willing to go in the new normal. Um, you know, perhaps we've heard from, mo from many that they're 
very excited to travel to more familiar destinations, perhaps domestically right now or on some short duration programming, but nonetheless excited to travel. So that's very hopeful. To that end, we uh, at Orbridge are doing similar things as, as my friends at AHI and Go Next and looking at how we modify our programs to keep guests safe. Um, we actually do have some domestic programming that will operate in August. And uh, that programming will include um, health screenings. Uh, it will include um, social distancing. We are asking all guests to wear masks uh, whenever they're in group spaces and, um, you know, uh, many, many new safety protocol in terms of cleaning um, from the motor coaches to the hotel rooms and requirements that we've asked of our suppliers on the ground. Um, and I can be more specific about that, but it's uh, really a, a high, high level of detail. So we are sharing all of this with our guests in advance of the program so that they're, um, and I think that's important to mention that um, guests should be asking, you should be asking your, your travel providers how they're responding to this and how they're keeping you safe. And so we're sharing that proactively with our guests and the response has been exceedingly positive. You know, uh, folks who want to travel are, um, they're welcoming that information and really willing to be flexible in how travel looks now, um, the mask wearing and so on. Um, so I hope that's a little bit, a little bit of an answer. Yeah, I think that was great. I mean, I think you're right. I think that we're, um, our travelers are all sort of looking to the industry to um, provide information to make them feel more comfortable. Um, one of the questions that came in was, um, do you expect the venues and restaurants um, to operate at full capacity? And if so, what kind of time frame do you think that will happen? Um, I guess I'll jump in here too. Um, I don't think that's going to happen. I mean, even most governments have, you know, regulations now about, you know, the capacity that restaurants um, can operate in. I would say that um, that again is going to be take a little bit of time before uh, restaurants will be able to operate at full capacity sometime next year, I would, I would guess. And uh, I would say um, that, you know, also that impacts things like, you know, oftentimes breakfasts are served as buffets and that kind of thing. So that is also going to change moving forward. Um, there'll be, you know, served meals um, rather than um, people walking through a line, picking things off a buffet table, those kinds of things. So those, those protocols, I think, will stay in place for um, the near future, uh, again, until we kind of feel like we're somewhat through um, this, the whole virus experience that we're all enjoying. And, you know, Kelly, what we'll have is specially trained travel directors to help travelers navigate all these kind of new normal, uh, you know, situations uh, from having additional PPE to telling them to wash their hands um, to uh, just uh, knowing what the local on the ground situation is with restaurants, uh, with the hotels, with museums, with venues. And so we've actually gone out and trained um, all of our 92 travel directors uh, with the special uh, kind of uh, tra training in this new normal. And so we're very proud of this and we've uh, put that out on our website of the HI health and safety protocols, including the special training that we've uh, you know, accommodated for all of our travel directors. But I think they will help a lot of the travelers navigate this new normal. So it's it's really interesting how this conversation has has changed, right? We would be talking about how much beach time do you get on this trip, or <laughs> which which uh, churches are we going to be visiting on on this excursion? Uh, and but now we're, we're you know the conversation is around public health and safety and personal health and cleaning and and all of that. Um, and so with that in mind, let's take a trip around the world here, okay? Because we're getting a lot of questions about. When is this going to, when is this place going to reopen? When is this place going to start accepting Americans to come there? Or when do you see restrictions? So let's start, um, let's start with Russia and, and Croatia and maybe Eastern Europe um, in terms of when you might think trips might start, uh, start returning to those regions. 
Well, thank, thank you, Paul. I mean, as far as Croatia, you could actually go to Croatia right now. Uh, there's no, there's no, the only thing that you would really need, of course, is a, a test within 72 hours that says that uh, you do test negative for, uh, for the virus. And so for Croatia, there really is a no restriction. Um, but of course, um, you know, I'm not sure how many folks would uh, consider going to Croatia right at this, uh, right at this moment. Uh, right. As far as Russia, of course, it's up to the Russian government for uh, visas to, uh, you know, to give visas to Americans. And they're not really, um, that's really a, a, a very slow process right now. So although uh, you can go to Russia, it will take a while to get a visa. Plus, there's a mandatory 14-day quarantine when you do uh, enter, enter uh, Moscow. And, and they have lightened up on uh, or reopening a lot of their uh, venues, museums, restaurant, bars, but still you would uh, be required for a 14-day quarantine. The, 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 the real uh, issue right now, I think as we all know it, is um, uh, most of these uh, European countries are not letting Americans in because the virus is very intense here in the States. And I think until we can get the virus under control and uh, get, get to the measure of how they measure it. It's um, how many 100,000 uh, citizens, how many uh, new cases per 100,000 citizens. As soon as we uh, attach to their average, uh, their average right now is 18.8 .8, uh, citizens per 100,000. And if uh, the US can get below that, then we'll, a lot of the opportunities for us to travel to these uh, European countries uh, will, will open. Right now, America is at 20, 0.5, I believe, per 100,000, uh, we're getting better, but we're still not at a point um, where the EU uh, has uh, kind of uh, voted to, uh, you know, to, to allow us in on, on those countries, and they review this every, every two weeks. So, Zach and, and Vanessa, maybe shake your magic eight ball here for a second. <laughs> uh, if someone is planning on, for example, taking uh, a a Dutch waterways trip in April of 2021. Uh, can they can they be reasonably confident that they're going to get on that, that they're going to be able to go on that trip? To, so, um, tell me what what how your perspective is on that. Uh, I'm Vanessa. I'm, you want to? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have no right answer. Um, I'll just uh, have the caveat that I'm an eternal optimist. So I'm going to say. Absolutely. Um, but I do think that guests need to be prepared for um, it looking different, for the program is going to look different. And I think well into 2021, um, tours are going to be, uh, they're going to be adjusted slightly. You know, we might, we might see adjustments to certain excursions. You might see adjustments like uh, Joe said, you know, to buffet meals various adjustments. And I think the critical piece is uh, guests, being flexible in how those adjustments look. Um, I can say, I know all of us, uh, Zach and Mark and Joe and I, and our teams are working so hard to make sure that the experiences are just as meaningful, but they might look a little different. So as long as guests are willing to kind of uh, go with the flow and take the lead of the travel director, which like Mark said, is gonna be uh, extremely um, knowledgeable about exactly what's going to happen on the ground, what guests need, need to be aware of, um, any, you know, slight changes to the itinerary. If they can just take their lead and, and be a little flexible, I think their experience will likely be quite positive. Good answer. Great. And then yeah, all great answer. And I, oh, go, go, ahead. Ahead. go ahead, Mark. <laughs> oh, I was just going to say, um, you know, and Paul, if you're selling that crystal ball, let me know and I can, uh, <laughs> I'll come and pick it up from you. Um, but, you know, I, I think Vanessa said it really well, too. Um, you know, we, we, we do want, if, if you're on a trip, it, it's departing in April of next year, uh, call Kelly, call us, ask questions. Um, you know, we're, we're here to advocate. Uh, we're an advocate for you. Um, we're not going to send, I, I, can, I think I can speak for all, all the companies here represented. Uh, we're not going to send you into a dangerous situation. Um, you know, we, we don't want that to happen. Uh, health and safety is our number one priority, uh, but certainly, you know, call us, ask questions, um, and, you know, I think we all wish we could fast forward to January or February next year to see where we're at, so. Hey, Zach, let's stay right there for, let's stay right there for a second, though. Uh, as COVID situations are being monitored and you don't want to send travelers into 
dangerous situations. How much advance time is, is typical to be notified if a trip is going to be canceled? And does that differ between a land tour and a cruise? Yeah, you know, that's, that's a great question, too. And I think that that has the systems obviously have changed, you know, significantly and the timeline has changed significantly since March. Um, you know, I would say a, a month prior to departure is when you're going to probably hear from us on whether or not we're going to make a decision on that trip. Um, but again, it's about asking questions and seeing what your options are as a traveler. Um, you know, if, if you don't feel comfortable traveling, uh, certainly we want to provide you an option, whether that be a, you know, future cruise credit or a voucher uh, or a, a refund. So we're going to educate you on what those options are, depending on how far out you are from uh, that departure actually taking place. And just to say that we're going to be extremely committed to, 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 to everyone. We're going to communicate uh, very often uh, with all the travelers on what the current situation is. So um, Zach said, you know, 30 uh, days at the, at the very uh, least. Uh, uh, some of us, I'm sure, are communicating 45 to 60 days prior on the, on the current situation. But what we all are going to do is uh, of course answer all your questions and then we're going to communicate 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 on what the current situation is because that is going to change uh it's it's changing every day and so we that's that's the least that we could do with for, with our great travelers great so going back to um somebody had mentioned uh the visa uh with russia and how long it takes to get that um with the current situation, do you think that our reciprocal visa agreements are going to be honored as the U.S. reopens its borders uh, to other nations? Yes, I think I think they will. Again, I, I agree with Mark that there needs to be certain standards met, I think, both on our part and on the part of other countries before uh, we'll be allowed to travel there and they'll be allowed to travel here. But I do think that, um, you know, there's a great urgency by all of the countries around the world to get travel reopened again. And uh, they want to see Americans coming to um, internationally and they want to see, uh, and of course the U.S. wants to see travelers from other countries coming here. So there's huge amount of, um, of concern about uh, the fact that we can't travel and there's a huge impulse to try to open things up uh, as soon as possible. Uh, again, based on, you know, the safety of the passengers. And um, so, I, I, yes, I think that that will, borders will open uh, and things will loosen up when the environment is right uh, from a health and safety perspective. Yeah, a lot of the countries are trying to create, just like Australia and New Zealand, they're trying to create what's called a travel bubble. And uh, I think that's what Joe was saying earlier with these airlines, the airlines, the U.S. airlines are trying to create some type of travel bubble into Europe. And uh, of course, governments are, are very aware that, that's, that they want to do that because, you know, tourism is a big part of these countries, uh, you know, GDP, uh, Italy, Spain, France, and uh, they love Americans. So I think uh, Joe's exactly right that there's going to be some pressure to create both from private and from governments to create as many travel bubbles as possible. And it's interesting to see that uh, Europe has opened up to some extent. They've created um, some bubbles in Europe. And it, it's a great um, kind of um, pilot program, I think, for the rest of the world to watch as uh, people do start to travel internationally within Europe. And it becomes kind of a model um, on you know, how we can see travel opening up in, in a larger way down the road. So it's been pretty good experiment so far. There's been a few. Um, um, mix-ups is these, one of the things that's happened is as these European countries have opened up, um, the people have started going back to, the local people have started going back to the office and working, and that's increased the, some of the uh, rise in the cases in some of these countries. Uh, for the most part, travelers have been uh, pretty good um, in, in not contracting, you know, the virus on their travels with some few exceptions. So it's a, I think it's a good experiment and I think it'll be a good um, thing to keep our eye on as uh, we see how things go in, in Europe as they open up for travel. Sorry, I got a fire engine going by. <laughs> and All right, Mrs. So Zach, maybe you can uh, jump in. Um, do you anticipate prices to go up, up um, for travel if the capacities are affected um, and with the additional safety measures that are being implemented? 
Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And I, I think that, you know, moving forward, um, I mean, we're, we're already seeing, you know, our partner like Oceana, they, they are offering some price reductions for 2021, uh, also into 2022 as well. Um, I think that you will see some good offers out there, but I think that with, you know, reduced capacity and, you know, these extra uh, health and safety procedures uh, go into effect, uh, you might see prices kind of leveling out and staying the same, at least from, from our standpoint and our perspective. All right, there's a couple questions that have come in here that are just really quick hitters. Um, who is your European Rivership providers? Why don't we start with, with Orbridge and go to go next and then AHI? I'm actually going to punt because we don't do any European River cruising. So I'm okay. going to punt to my friends over it and go next in AHI. Uh, we utilize scenic river cruises. Uh, they're an all-inclusive uh, river cruise provider. It's a five-star ship. It's a, a lovely way to cruise the, the Rhine as well as the Danube. Great. And AHI? Yeah, we use uh, Lufner cruises in Europe and Quasi uh, in Europe. And uh, the great thing is that we charter these river vessels, completely charter them. And so uh, we've limited the capacity on them for, for next year. So 160 a passenger capacity, maximum capacity riverboat, uh, we would only put 100 to 120 uh, uh, souls on it. So uh, we feel very good that um, we could do, uh, that, that follows kind of our health and safety uh, uh, protocols. Great. All right, okay. next question. So, go ahead. Uh, go ahead, Jeff. I was just going to say quickly that um, the other thing is since we charter them, we do create all of our own excursions and uh, they're much more comprehensive and in depth than what you would get if you just take a cruise on a regular retail uh, cruise ship. That's all I have to say. Yeah, Vanessa, Carl wants to know, are you partnering with Quark Expeditions for the Antarctica trip? He recognized the jackets in the ship. We are not, no, we're chartering that vessel. Okay, okay. And then, um, you know, how do you get, how do you actually enforce social distancing on, uh, Vanessa, for example, you showed the picture of the train going through the Canadian Rockies, or if you're using a motor coach, uh, how, do, how, is that, um, how is that enforced? Sure, so uh, just as an example, on our upcoming National Parks program, we have 52 seat motor coach that we're limiting to 16 passengers. So uh, we'll have every third seat filled. Um, all of the touchable surfaces will be, will be wiped down as everyone exits the motor coach. We have the uh, coach, um, gosh, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the name of the uh, equipment. It's the same equipment that's used on the airplanes before the program, at the end of the program, um, to spray it down. Uh, the driver is wiping all touchable surfaces um, every hour, uh, if possible. So those are just some of the protocol, but radically limited number of guests on the program. Great. Well, we want to thank you all for joining us today. We have run out of time, unfortunately. Uh, and we got to most of the questions, but if you still have questions remaining, feel free to reach out to our friends at AHI, Orbridge, and Go Next. They will answer all the questions that you might have about a trip that you are planning. And of course, Kelly Morganti is ready and waiting by her phone uh, to answer any questions that you might have about how the Penn State Alumni Association can take you around the world. Very, very much appreciate everybody uh, participating in today's virtual speaker session. As always, you can find more information at alumni.psu.edu slash events. Thank you for all you do for the university, for the glory, and for the future. We are Penn State. Penn State. Thank you, guys. Thanks very much. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye.